Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and yodeling cowgirl. You know, Michael Eisner's final days as Disney CEO were so inglorious that sometimes it's easy to forget he was one of the major architects of the Disney Renaissance. With his help, the company finally emerged from the dark days following Walt's death, released some of their most beloved and critically acclaimed works, and grew into the multimedia juggernaut we all love and love to hate today. But the bloom was off the rose by the turn of the millennium, and Eisner's last few years with the company were marked by increasingly disappointing animated offerings, with one or two exceptions, culminating with our next offender, Home on the Range. Whereas in the 90s, Disney ruled the animation roost and everyone else tried to play catch up to them, Home on the Range is about Disney trying to play catch up to the likes of Pixar and DreamWorks. Their solution? A kind of weird western fantasy loosely based on the Pied Piper legend deliberately pitched at the level of your average four-year-old. You're starting to see the problem here, right? No wonder Disney ignores this movie more than the one with actual racism in it. Eisner was shown the door at about the time the film was released, but even more sadly, its failure all but completely killed two-dimensional feature animation in the United States, because clearly the other movies were doing so well because they were computer-generated, not because they had good stories and characters or anything like that. Tell that to this guy. In fact, we haven't even started the film yet, and I'm already going to give it sin number one for the harm it did to sell animation. Nice going, Home on the Range. How many more ways can you piss me off? Ellen Menken leads us in with an expository song that I swear sounds like the western cousin of the Virginia Company from Pocahontas. Out in the land where the men are tough as cactus, out in the land where the wild wild west was won, out in the land of the desperado, if your salt is an avocado, yee-haw, you brought the holy soil. During this song, we get an example of sin number two, the bad comic interludes. Disney is going for some good old-fashioned Chuck Jones slapstick in this movie, but their timing is a complete mess. Even slapstick needs a kind of rhythm to it. Take your average Wile E. Coyote cartoon, for example. There's the setup, the execution which goes pear-shaped in an entertaining way, usually a nice beat as Wile E. comprehends the world of hurt he's in for, and finally the payoff. The slapstick in this movie is just the characters being flung from one supposedly hilarious crisis to another with no sense of build-up. You can tell the movie is just throwing everything it can at the wall to see what sticks, and very little does. One of the more pointless routines involves our bovine protagonists running amuck in a saloon, in what is some of the stupidest attempts at comedy I've ever seen. And remember, I've seen the ending of the pirate movie. Son! You call that a drag joke? Come on, Disney, you used to do good drag jokes. Oh, and when the humor isn't being inane, it's being unnecessarily crass. Not surprising when your lead is voiced by Roseanne Barr. Yeah, they're real. Quit staring. Nothing like a cow flashing her teats for quality children's entertainment. Barr plays Maggie, a cow who's being sold by her owner after the rest of her herd was rustled by the dastardly Alameda Slim. She gets dropped off at Patch of Heaven, which is the subject of sin number three. I know a place, pretty as pie, I the river bend hits up with the end of the sky, it's left in Nebraska. I have a hard time believing the songs in this movie were by Alan freaking Menken. Really, Alan? You're the guy who wrote A Whole New World and Bells of Notre Dame and Little Shop of Horrors. You're better than this pseudo-swing Randy Newman on autopilot crap. Also, this entire setup kind of bothers me. What exactly do they do here at Patch of Heaven anyway? It's called a dairy farm, but that doesn't seem likely as there are only two, later three, cows, none of which get milked. They do sell produce, but there doesn't seem to be enough land to make that profitable, and it's obvious none of these critters are being raised for meat. This is more like a child's picture book idea of a farm. Just a bunch of general ideas about rural life all thrown together in one place. 
Already living at Patch of Heaven are Mrs. Calloway, the dignified British cow who opposes everything Maggie does on general plot principle, and Grace, the goofy one. Maggie gets a cool reception when she arrives, because that's always what happens when the cocky newcomer shows up in the close-knit community. But we don't have time for that, because the plot comes in close behind her, in the form of the local sheriff who tells Patch of Heaven's owner Pearl that the bank is foreclosing on her property, and if they don't get their money in three days, the entire old McDonald crew will be tossed out on their rump roasts. Yeah, but they can't take my place. Well, I've been hit through twisters, blizzards. Unseasonable humidity, prairie dog stampedes, sharknadoes, you name it! Maggie thinks maybe they can save the farm by winning prize money at the county fair, but in order to do that, they need to talk to the sheriff's horse, Buck, about getting a loan extension. Because the sheriff's horse is responsible for that, apparently. So the cows head off into town, Mrs. Calloway and Maggie doing their odd couple routine along the way, where Buck is currently pretending he's in a Sergio Leone movie. Ugh, I already hate Buck. In fact, that's sin number four. The protagonists are just annoying. Maggie is supposed to be quick-witted and fun, but she's really abrasive and irritating. As for Buck, he's entirely too full of himself, has delusions of being a hero, and acts like, well, like an over-caffeinated Cuba Gooding Jr. But the worst part is how nasty they are to the other characters, and to each other. Maggie especially takes delight in seeing Mrs. Calloway and Buck suffer. Did you just hit me? Kinda. Well, stop it. Why? Because I don't like it. Oh! Now, I'm no professional, but I'd say the only mono a mono you'll be doing is in your dreams. Oh, look out, Buck! He's making a move on your left flank. Parouche! Maggie! Grace! Leave that poor animal alone. <laughs> You know how when Pixar was making Toy Story, they had to pretty much redo the whole thing halfway through development because they realized Woody was such a terrible character that he made the entire movie unwatchable? This is what would have happened if they hadn't come to their senses. Buck isn't interested in helping the cows because he too needs to learn the value of friendship or whatever it is we're going on about here, and besides, he has bigger things on his mind. Isn't that a cut line from They Call the Wind Mariah? The rain is Tess, the fire is Joe, and they call the high pressure front bringing afternoon thunder showers, Rico! Rico is a bounty hunter and clearly not a turncoat in disguise who is on the trail of Alameda Slim, and wouldn't you know it, the bounty on Slim is exactly the amount needed to save Patch of Heaven. So Maggie's all, let's capture the cattle rustler ourselves and save the farm, and Mrs. Calloway is all, I'm going to be all snooty and dismissive because I don't like you, and Buck is all, yay, I get to ride with Rico on his big bounty hunt, and Grace is all, I just exist to give Jennifer Tilly some boilerplate dits dialogue. Anyway, Maggie figures they can get Slim to come to them if they can only find a cattle drive to hook up with. We've no reason to believe this chuck wagon is heading off to a cattle drive. Hey, Tommy! Have fun on that cattle drive! All right, then. Mm -hmm. Eh, comedy, plot convenience, six on one claw, half dozen on the other, right? Through no effort of their own, the heroes get roped up to the chuck wagon, and it's off to the open range. Well, at least Roseanne isn't the one doing the singing. While traveling, they pass by Maggie's old farm getting auctioned off in an attempt to convince us that there's stakes in this plot, not to be confused with the stakes I'd like to make from the main characters. Oh, and look, it's obviously not the villain's alter ego buying up the land cheap after he's driven the previous owners away. I hate this movie so much for making me read that. And now to make things extra uncomfortable, here's 10 hours of walking in a cattle drive as a heifer. Just ignore them, and perhaps they'll go away. Oh, they seem like nice guys. Maybe they can help well, us. Sure we can help <laughs> you. Maybe we can help each other. Mm -hmm. Sexual harassment. You know, for kids. 
Yeah, I know I stole that from the nostalgia critic, but he stole it from the Hudsucker proxy, so turn about is fair play. Mercifully, the cattle rustlers show up before anybody can get naturally inseminated, which means it's time for our big villain song. You see Your villain, ladies and gentlemen! A fat cowboy dressed like a Las Vegas sign who hypnotizes cows with his yodeling. Sin number five is Alameda Slim. First, his song? Well, it's not going to replace Hellfire on anybody's playlist anytime soon. Extra points off for stealing from one of your better movies, Disney. Next, there's his villain rant, which is light on the motivation, something about wanting to buy up the whole territory in revenge for the landowners not taking him seriously or something, and heavy on the exposition. Now that all his cash cows have disappeared, that poor sap's gonna be flat broke. Perfect time for a certain upstanding landowner to step in and take all the land. Uh, who are you? How do you do with Uncle Slim? Put up your dukes, Mr. Fancy Britches. <laughs> it's me. Hello. You get the impression Slim is explaining this not because his henchmen are stupid, but because the writers think children are. Oddly enough, in an earlier draft of the script, Slim was amassing a bovine army to march on Washington, D.C. and take the White House, which is something I wouldn't mind seeing. It would have been more interesting than this steal the rancher's cattle and then buy their land when they go bankrupt plot. But Slim hasn't snatched up Patch of Heaven yet because, get this, the parcel of land is in the exact shape of his henchman's head and the henchman has blocked that part of the map every time he sat down. I hate this movie so much for making me utter that sentence. Grace doesn't get hit with Slim's whammy because she's tone deaf because that's how that works, apparently, and she's able to snap the other two out of it, so they're hanging around when Rico and Buck show up. Buck's showing off convinces Rico that the horses skittish around cows and he abandons him, so Buck decides to go and catch Slim single-hooved. Now it's a race between the annoying, egotistical horse we don't like and the bickering cows trying to save a farm we don't care about. It's going to be a long 40 minutes. <sighs> what can we use to pass the time? I know! How about a pointless action sequence? Flashback! Get to high ground! <laughs> Mrs. Calloway blames Maggie for making them lose their farm, even though she had absolutely nothing to do with the whole foreclosure thing. But there's a law which says the heroes have to have a big falling out at the crisis point, which helps contribute to their character development, so there it is. Is it time for a sad montage now? Yes, I think so. Rain is pouring down like the heavens are heard. Seems like it's been dark since the devil knows when. The sad montage set to Will the Sun Never Shine Again is sin number six. Basically, the song is trying to convince us to feel bad about characters we've barely seen and relationships that are never established. What if the Why would we care if the sheriff is worried about Buck? We've seldom seen them together, and nothing in their interaction has established the kind of relationship they have. Lilo and Stitch, which, like this movie, was big on the whole family thing, took time to develop the characters and how they affected each other, so we were invested in their bond and what happened to it when the time came for them to be tested. This movie gives us over a half hour of characters sniping at each other, and then tries to tug the heartstrings with, Oh look, it's raining and the characters are sad and Bonnie Raitt is singing, doesn't that just get you right in the feels? Not so much, no. Good morning, ladies. I see you're already tucked in your appetizer. Hey, look, the rabbit from the beginning of the movie, whom we haven't seen since then, has shown up to help the heroes. Isn't that convenient? Lucky Jack. It's funny because he's missing a foot, ha 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 ha. Also happens to know where Alameda Slim's secret hideout is, which is even more convenient. So Grace, who's all on this Slim took my farm from me and I want revenge kick, is prepared to go after him alone. But it'll be dangerous going after Slim all by yourself. Hey, I got the rabbit. If this movie hadn't completely killed my sense of humor, that might have been funny. 
Maggie gets the other cows to help by promising to leave Patch of Heaven for good if they'll help her deal with Slim. Which is a pretty shitty way to sell your teamwork and family message, but hey, whatever makes the movie end faster. So they head off to the abandoned mine slash hideout, where Buck is trying to talk his way past Slim's guard Buffalo Jr. Hey, what gives? How come they got to go through? They're cows. What? But what about the rabbit? Well, obviously he was with the cows. Uh, I'm with the cows too. Yeah. Hey, hey cows. Wait, wait up. Why is Buck even in this movie? He's not funny and he contributes almost nothing to the plot. Even Grace does more than him because she comes up with the brilliant idea of plugging the cow's ears with Jack's tail. That almost sounds dirty. So when Slim gets angry because his yodeling doesn't have the desired effect, they're able to knock him into a minecart. I gave up clown college for this? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. What? All clowns are demons in disguise. I thought that was common knowledge by now. dare you defile the goofy yell by putting it in this movie. Sin number seven for this entire sequence in the mine. It's dumb, it's not funny, and it just shows how thin this entire story is by dragging it out to no purpose. The whole thing ends when everyone has a harmless head-on collision with an oncoming train, remember that, after which Slim decides to do something useful, escape, and rustle up the cows for the slaughterhouse. Oh, and it turns out Rico is on his payroll all along because who didn't see that coming, right? Learning his idol is a turncoat finally spurs Buck into action. Buck, have you gone crazy? Now that's entirely possible! Oh. Or maybe I just figured out oh, oh. who the real heroes are! Wait, what if this is some kind of trick? Oh, this isn't a trick! It's a miracle! No, it's sin number eight. You cannot have this character act like a complete ass for nearly the entire movie and then have him do a complete 180 and call it character development. It's not even fun watching him stick it to the bad guys because he's just being the same idiot show-off he was earlier. He's just doing it for a different reason now. Rico's down for the count and the cattle are saved, but Slim escaped and is on his way to buy Patch of Heaven. Luckily, the train track runs right by the farm, which the cows know because... Who cares? Explaining would just make the movie longer. So, showing their newfound appreciation for teamwork, just go with it. They ride the rails to the rescue. Oh no! It's the morning express! Oh come on! The cows already survived one train crash. Why would we be worried about another one happening? You can't just pick and choose universe rules as the situation demands. Anyway, the cows crash the engine through the gate just as Alameda Slim has bought the farm. Not figuratively, alas. Cue the Sub Morricone score because it's time for the big showdown! Hold it right there! Piggies, it's time to open up a can of whoop high! Who the? Just kidding! It's time for the ineffective villain to get kicked around by the barely established barnyard animals. Slim is unmasked and arrested, the farm is saved, even though they're going to need at least another 750 to fix the damage caused by that train, and everyone has learned a valuable lesson about friendship or something or other. Maggie is about to make good on her promise and leave, but you know how that turns out. She ends up staying at Patch of Heaven, big hugs all around, yada yada. Everybody wins first prize at the fair, Pearl and the Sheriff are an item now apparently, sure why not, and everybody's all one big happy family, including the buffalo and the dude bro steers. Home on the Range is so disappointing because it's from people who can and should have done better. Say what you want about the whole Disney industrial complex, there's certainly plenty to criticize there. The primary thing their legacy is built on is quality family entertainment. Not just movies for kids, because anyone can distract the five and under set with silly cartoons, but works of art that transcend generational appeal and stand the test of time. 
everyone involved with this movie, the producers, the animators, Alan Menken, the voice cast, is working far below their level to such little purpose. The plot is stupid, the characters are either dull or downright unlikable, and even though the film runs only an hour and 15 minutes, it feels like forever. This movie left such a terrible taste in my mouth that I am condemning all of the characters in it to be served up buffet style. Yes, even the humans. I got high marks for cannibalism in Clown College, you know. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. (laughs) 